I have a memory that has etched itself into a special place up here. It's from one of my work shifts in the obstetrics and gynecology department in one of the main hospitals in Stockholm. My patient was in her late 20s and she had to give labor through an emergency C-section. She had severe bleeding and I was distributing bag after bag after bag of blood. There and then it felt like it would never stop and I remember thinking to myself, what if we run out of blood right now? This is not by any means an unusual situation in my department. Actually, severe bleeding is common and the need for blood is huge. Not only to save the lives of mothers that are bleeding, but to save lives across the entire healthcare system. According to the blood service, one bag of donated blood is needed every single minute. I'll repeat that for you. One bag of blood is needed every minute. So by the time that this talk is finished, approximately 18 bags have been used. And just like the entire healthcare system, the blood services has also been struck hard by the ongoing pandemic. So this is why it's more important than ever to right now discuss the policies that are governing who can and who cannot donate blood. In this talk today, I want us to focus on a group that in the past has been permanently banned from donating blood and still today are challenging, are facing rules that essentially prevents them from donating blood. I am referring to men who have sex with men, or MSM, as I will refer to here. And I want us to talk about why we should prioritize science over stigma to create blood policies that will benefit every single one of you watching this. Let us start with the state of the nation. What are the rules governing blood donation in Sweden today? A person's suitability is based on a quarantine period, otherwise known as a deferral period. And this deferral period is essentially decided by risk factors for contracting diseases that are transmissible through a blood donation. When it comes to MSM, all sex between men are considered a sexual risk behavior. And therefore, this huge group of people are largely excluded from donating blood. Let us visualize how the current regulation works with an example. Meet John. John is a 25-year-old, identifying himself as male and heterosexual. He is currently single and enjoying being a part of Stockholm's dating scene. In the past month or so, he's engaged sexually with three different partners, all women. He is living his best life, and there is nothing wrong with that. And now, let's meet David. David is also 25 years old, identifying himself as male and gay. He's been living with his partner, Michael, for the last three years. David and Michael have both only engaged sexually with each other during this time. David is also living his best life and there is nothing wrong with that either. So from a risk perspective, John is exposing himself to a much more greater risk of a sexually transmitted disease. But when you read the policy, John can actually walk straight from one of his current partners into the blood service and donate his blood without any deferral. And what about David? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Because according to the current regulations, men who have sex with men needs to be totally sexually abstinent for six months before donating blood in Sweden. And this means that our David, he has to stay totally sexually abstinent even from his only partner for six months before even thinking about donating blood. Why, you may wonder. It's not for any evidence-based medical reasons, 
It's not because David is reporting any risky behavior. It's simply because his sexual partner is a man. This is the state of blood donation in Sweden. When it comes to MSM, it's not a policy based on actual risk exposure, and it doesn't even increase the patient's safety. What it does do, however, is that it excludes potentially potential donors from being able to help out, and it also stigmatizes an already vulnerable group. The TEDx event is named From Mirage to Oasis, and this made me think, What's my vision for the future? Well, for me, it is very simple. I think it would be amazing if everyone who wants to donate blood and is able to do that in a safe way also was allowed to do that. And to reach this, we need evidence-based policies. And we actually already have the evidence but we need to apply this evidence to our policies. And that is not done right now. Now, I want us to take a step back here and look at the past. The rules that essentially prevent David from giving blood did once fill a purpose, but that was many years ago. The rules were created during the HIV epidemic, which in the 80s and 90s struck the MSM population very hard. But this epidemic ended long time ago. So why can't our David donate blood without a deferral today? Well, the National Board of Health and Welfare, they states that the risk for contracting HIV is 40 times higher for MSM as compared, compared to a man who has sex with a woman. But what does this mean? And does this statement really hold true if we look into the actual numbers? Last year, there were 22 individuals who contracted HIV through heterosexual contacts. And if those 22 heterosexuals are the low risk group and MSM is the high risk group, how many MSM do you think contracted HIV during the same period of time? Was it 100, 1000? Maybe 10,000 MSM? Actually, it's 20. 20 men contracted HIV through sexual contact with another man in Sweden last year, and 22 in the heterosexual group. Here's an image based on data from the last 10 years collected by the Public Health Agency of Sweden. And as you can see, the yearly number of new infections is similar in both groups. However, when considering the size of MSM population and the size of Sweden's population, the relative incidence is indeed higher amongst MSM. But it's important to mention that incidence is not the same as risk, and definitely not the same as the actual risk of transmission through a blood donation. So, here in Sweden, the authorities choose to talk about the 40 times higher risk for MSM. And this sounds really, really high. And so high that it ends up with this incredibly distorted perception of that we are in, in, the, in the middle of a burning epidemic. An epidemic that I, as I said, ended many, many years ago. Since year 2000, the HIV incidence in Sweden has been low. So the quest question becomes, 40 times higher than what? Instead of talking about 40 times higher, we should talk about more relevant numbers. I don't want you to be cheated by numbers anymore. I want to show you the actual risk. According to the latest risk model by the Public Health Agency of Sweden, with today's policies, there will be one additional person infected with HIV from receiving blood within 30,000 years. What's interesting here is that both of these facts, the 40 times higher and the one new case in 30,000 years, comes from the same knowledge base created 
by the same authority, the Public Health Agency of Sweden, at the same time and for the same purpose. But what has happened is that the National Board of Health and Welfare has chosen to defend a more restrictive regulation, cherry-picking the 40 times higher risk and totally throwing aside the actual modelled risk. And that's not fair. Let me briefly explain the deferral periods. A deferral period is needed when there can be a delay between the moment of infection until we are sure to detect it with the testing that is used. This is commonly referred to as a window period and different infections and even different testing methods gives us different window periods. But get this, all donated blood is tested. And with the current tests used in Sweden, the window period for HIV is at most six weeks. Yet the policy is that MSM must wait for six months. So as you can see, in terms of HIV, the actual window period is not at all in proportion with the six month deferral. So now you might be asking, well, aren't there other infections such as hepatitis C, which actually has longer window periods? That is correct. But the fact is that today's incident data shows that MSM is not overrepresented for any of those diseases with longer window periods, like hepatitis C. So what the policy does here is that it's lumping together different infections resulting in overgeneralizing blanket rules. Let us go back to our friends John and David again. Now, given the fact that we know that all blood is tested, and we know that the actual risk is the window period, then who do you think is the most suitable donor? Well, my money is on David. Don't you find it odd that John, who very recently exposed himself to a potential risk of a sexually transmitted infection, is able to donate without any restrictions? While David, who has not been exposed to nearly as much of a risk, has to stay abstinent from sex for six months. We can conclude that we have a blood donation policy in Sweden that is overly generalizing, and it deems all sex between men as a risk behavior. How can we change this and use science over stigma to create policies that allows more blood and less stigma. Well, one way to do this is through a more individual-based approach. And we have the evidence to suggest that this can work. First of all, a recent study compared infection rates amongst re recurring blood donors and MSMs that are deemed suitable to donate after filling out a individual risk assessment. Unsurprisingly, they found no differences in those groups when we look at the relevant infections. And secondly, if we look at compliance, acceptance has been found the strongest driver of compliance. In countries where previous lifelong bans for MSM was lifted, an increase of risk was expected. But several studies have investigated the actual risk after lifting the lifelong ban. And those studies found that the actual risk after lifting it was rather insignificant or even decreased. This can be explained by the assumption that people became more compliant to the policy. This to me indicates that we should strive for policies that are understandable and justifiable then we will achieve better adherence to the policy and as a result, we will increase the patient's safety. Combining these type of evidence with the low incident rates and add to this, if you want, more modern testing and new technology such as pathogen inactivation, 
we have no longer any reason to exclude MSM. I'm sad to say, Sweden is falling behind. Taking a look outside of Sweden, we can see that a lot of countries are actually lowering their deferral periods lower than six months. Down to three months or four months, US, Canada, Australia, even our neighbors, Finland and Denmark, and many other European countries with them. And taking it one step further, there are countries that actually are removing the deferral period for MSM completely. Both the UK and the Netherlands are implementing individual screening so that MSM not exposed to any risk also can become donors. Isn't that great? Before I finish my talk today, there is one more thing that I haven't told you yet, and this is the embarrassing part. This policies that we have here in Sweden, the six month deferral, this is not old. This came to action only 27 days ago, this month, this year, 2021. And this is where we are today. But we know better and we can do better. Everyone will win when we finally change the policy. More donors that will result in more available blood. Evidence-based policies that will increase compliance and therefore increase the patient's safety. And the policy stigma against MSM will finally be removed. Let's go back to that memory that I told you about initially when I was administrating bag after bag after bag of blood to my patient, a mother-to-be. And this is what it's all about. Blood saves lives. We should strive for evidence-based policies that allow more people to donate. Such policies will save lives, not only through the increased amount of blood, but also through the destigmatization of men who have sex with men. It's time to choose science over stigma. Rainbow blood is also valuable. Thank you.